Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd Habata fillah Continuing on our study of Baluga Maram The Kitab and Nikah The Book of Marriage And we reached the section or the chapter Which is the third chapter Which refers to the bridal gift, the maha, bab as-sadaq. And before we get into the hadith, the first hadith and the ahadith, it's important to speak about some of the, some general points regarding the maha, regarding the dowry, and some of the general rulings pertinent to it. First of all, as-sadaq or the mahar as we know it, or the dowry, this is derived from the Arabic word uh, asidq, which means truth. Uh, and as it is considered a, by giving the dowry, or sadaq, it is considered a testimony to the truthfulness of the man uh, in his quest to marry a woman in his desire to marry a woman. So this is where the concept or the term uh, a sadaq comes from. And it has been known in the customs of the Arabs to have many different uh, terminologies that refer to this dowry. Uh, the sadaq, the mahar, farida, and it's also mentioned in the Quran, Hiba, uh, Ajr, and the Aqru, and the Alaiq. So these are also all names which reference the dowry. And it's very important for us to understand and know that it is an obligation to pay the dowry. It is an obligation to pay the sadaq. And this is evidenced in Surah An-Nisa verse 4 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitabihil kareem atu nisa'a sadukati hinna nahla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitabihil kareem and give to the women who you marry their sadaq with a good heart. So that this is something which is not forced, but it should be done out of a willingness. And this is an expression of the man's desire to uh, marry the woman. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al kareem in Surah An Nisa, verse uh, 24, Fama stem فَمَا اسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ هُنَّ فَأْتُوا هُنَّ أَجُورُ هُنَّ فَرِيدَةً وَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِيمَا تَرَضَيْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ فَرِيدَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فِي كِتَابِهِ الْكَرِيمِ So with those of whom you have enjoyed sexual relations give them their ujur as prescribed, and the ajur here is referring to the sadaq, or referring to the mahar, or referring to the uh, dowry, as prescribed. Uh, but if after a mahar is prescribed, you agree mutually to give more, there is no sin upon you. So the shahid here, or the main point of this verse, is that it is a uh, farida, that it is an obligation uh, to give this mahar, to give this dowry. And that this should be done willingly and as a part, part of fulfilling the marriage uh, contract. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al kareem Wala janaha alaykum an tankihu hunna ida ataytumu hunna ajuru hunna. And there will be no sin on you to marry them. If you have paid them their ujur to them, to them, meaning their mahar or their dowry. 
So again, this affirms for us the that the dowry is an obligation to pay uh, and is a part of the marital contract. It is a part of fulfilling that marital contract, which makes the, uh, as we mentioned, and the Prophet وسلم, said in a hadith that we already covered, that the, this mahar, this marital bond, makes the private parts lawful for one another. So it shows the importance of fulfilling that because it is only through the nikah, only through the marital bond, and, and of course, the right hand possession for the men that makes uh, the private parts lawful. Uh, another important aspect of this sadaq or of the mahar is that we have to know and understand that the mahar is for the woman. She takes it for herself and there is no share in it for her guardians. So whether this is her wali, meaning the wali, the uh, asli, asliya, meaning her father, or her, uh, you know, her, her brother or her grandfather, depending on the, the particular situation, or her uncles, that this mahar goes to the woman. And this, unfortunately, in many un-Islamic customs, but are the customs of many cultures that you find in many traditional societies that the parents take from the mahar. Or, in fact, in some of them, the parents take the whole mahar, that they are the ones who benefit from this marriage more than the woman as far as the sadaq. And the sadaq, or the, uh, uh, the dowry, is for the woman as we mentioned, and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned all throughout the Qur'an. So, uh, very important for us to understand that the guardians do not share in the dowry. And so it's, de uh, it's desirable to make haste in paying the mahar. This is the second uh, point or condition uh, of the mahar or the sadaq. Uh, it is reported on the authority of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an that he said when Ali radiallahu ta'ala an married Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said a'tiha shay'an give her something he said I do not have anything the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said where is your coat of chain mail that breaks swords so it shows us that there was an importance uh, in paying the mahar as soon as possible. Another important uh, condition of the mahar is that it is desirable to minimize the dowry, to not make it extravagant. And we uh, spoke about this briefly before, and as we get into the ahadith in this chapter, we'll uh, actually cover more extensively and detail this uh, important aspect. Because we know from experience and we know from uh, the situations in many of the Muslim countries that one of the problems they suffer from as far as social problems and social ills that result of this is expensive mahars, expensive sadaq or dowries. And specifically, very, uh, this is a very acute problem in the Arab world. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about Saudi Arabia or some of the other wealthy Gulf countries. Likewise, in the poor countries like Yemen, the same phenomenon, it is relevant that often the families demand a very high mahar, or it's a matter of tribal status, or status and lavishness of the woman, that she desires this and puts this difficulty and this burden upon her suitor, and it involves uh, major debt for, for the uh, suitors. And this is a, a, a big problem. So what do the youth end up turning to as an alternative? They turn to, unfortunately, uh, zina and uh, uh, homosexuality. And all of these problems exacerbate and become an increase all res as, a, as a result in part 
from high mahars because it's almost impossible to marry. And I've known many colleagues in Yemen especially and in Saudi Arabia who, you know, they have traditions where the oldest brother must marry first. Then they have traditions in which, uh, you know, the mahar, it must be a certain amount of money and they must take out loans, loans from the tribe, loans from other members of the family, uh, bank loans even, and all in order just to satisfy the mahar and just to begin the marital contract. And this is not even including the things which the, the, the wedding party and the other aspects which uh, some families require. So according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there should be, the mahar should be, the mahar should be minimalized. It is reported on the authority of Sahal ibn Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala that he said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married a man to a woman with an iron ring as a dowry. Uh, this is an authentic hadith and is reported on the authority of Uqbar ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala that he said the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Khair as sadaq Aisraha, uh, the best uh, sadaq is the easiest, meaning the, the smallest one. So that shows us that from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that according to using the sunnah as our scale, as our criterion, then we know and understand that minimalizing the mahar is actually the best and most desirable mahar. Another important condition of the mahar is the mahar of a woman whose mahar is not paid is that of her contemporaries if he consummates the marriage. Meaning that if there is a situation, and often we find this in Western cultures because we don't have the traditions, those people who reverted to Islam don't have the traditions of a mahar, of a dowry. So, often the question arises, what, what should be my mahar? You know, the women don't know uh, what, what they want exactly or uh, what they feel is just. So they don't really have an idea. So what we know from the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam and Islamic tradition and custom, according to the fuqaha, is that the mahar of the woman who does not stipulate a mahar and does not have a mahar should be in accordance with the customs of her society. Maybe her sisters, if she has Muslim sisters who married, or other Muslims, Muslims in the community who have married. Uh, so it should be according to the general custom of that society or of that uh, particular culture. It is reported on the authority of, of al qama who in turn reported on the authority of Abdullah bin Mas'ud that he was asked about a man who had married a woman without consummating the marriage with her or fixing any dowry uh, for her uh, till he died. Ibn Mas'ud said she would receive the type of dowry given to women of her class with no uh, diminution or excess, meaning that it shouldn't be less or it should not be excessive uh, and she should observe the waiting period, her idda, and have her share of inheritance. Upon hearing this, Ma'kul ibn Sinan al-Ash'aji said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam giving the same decision uh, as you have given regarding Birwa, uh, Birwa daughter of Washib, who is a woman from amongst us. Upon hearing that his opinion agreed with the judgment of the Prophet Sallallahu Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'an became very happy. This is an authentic hadith. So it shows us that the for the woman who does not stipulate a mahar or there's when there's a situation where the woman does not know uh, what she wants for a mahar, then it should go to the custom of her, her culture and her contemporaries. Uh, another important aspect regarding the mahar or the sadaq is that it is also disliked for a person to, to take on a burden regarding a mahar that they cannot fulfill. Okay, 
where it's going to be an excessive hardship and they can actually not afford this mahar. So actually taking in debt and all of these other uh, um, practices that have become common, unfortunately, in the Muslim world are not uh, uh, recommended practices and actually they are disliked practices because you're putting an excessive burden upon the uh, the husband <clears throat> and that this is, uh, you know, there's a lot of facade or a lot of uh, harm that results in putting this difficulty upon the husband. And I've heard of countless situations where people have had to pay excessive mahars so they were indebted. And then shortly, because of other practices that were un-Islamic, they divorced. And then the husband is just in a, uh, extreme debt, like maybe a hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, twenty thousand uh, dollars, for a woman, in which their marriage didn't even last a month, not even a week, in some circumstances, in some cases, and so then he is left with a debt. So this is an un Islamic practice. Uh, and Islam encourages us to be easy, and as we said from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is to make an easy mahar, and that's the best of mahars, or the best of, of uh, dowries, as the Prophet said. It's reported on the authority of Abu Hurairah that he said a man came to Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, I have contracted marriage with a woman of the Ansar, whereupon the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, did you look at her? For there is something in the eyes of the Ansar. Then the man said, I did look at her. The Prophet Sallallahu then asked, For what did you marry her? Meaning, what was the amount of the mahar? Uh, then he said, It was for awak. And awak is a uh, amount of gold. Uh, and, and actually, one of this unit of measurement is equal to 40 dirham. So then that would mean four times four is 16. So that would be 160 dirhams, which was a lot of money in this time. So the Prophet ﷺ said, for Awak, it seems as if you dig out silver from the side of this mountain. Uh, we have nothing which we can give you. There is a possibility that we may send you on an expedition where you may get war booty. So he sent that man on an expedition which was dispatched to Bani Abs. This is an authentic hadith. So it shows us that again, keeping the mahar down and not putting a, a burden, this is from the Sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu uh, Also from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as we'll cover shortly in the ahadith that we will uh, cover in this chapter, is that it is also uh, that a a poor man, someone who has limited and restricted means, can marry a woman from what he knows of the Quran. This is also in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu It was reported on the authority of Sahl ibn Sa'ad radiyallahu ta'ala to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam said, Hal ma'aki min al-Quran shay? How much of the Quran do you know? He said, I know such and such uh, a surah and such and such surah. And then counting them. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you know them by heart? He replied, yes. The Prophet ﷺ said, go, I marry you to her for the verses of the Quran which you have memorized. And this is an authentic hadith. So it shows us that also the mahar can be something as simple as teaching uh, the Quran. Often in... Um, the customs in the West, uh, women will marry for, uh, she will want the husband to buy her the Quran or buy her Sahih Bukhari in English or uh, to make hijrah with her or to bring her to Saudi Arabia, for example, or to give her a marital, uh, just a, a simple garment. So these types of mahars are very admirable in that they are putting very little burden upon the suitor, especially one who is restricted in his means. And likewise, some will ask, you know, some women, they seek out someone who has some knowledge to offer them and say, I want you to teach me something from the religion. And so this also 
can be the case uh, in, uh, in, in certain customs. But the shahid or the main point being that a man of restricted means can also fulfill the mahar uh, if the woman makes it easy upon her suitor. Another important uh, condition regarding mahars is that it is also permissible for a man uh, to accept Islam as a mahar. It is reported on the authority of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala that he said Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala married Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala and the dawr or the mahar was his acceptance of Islam. Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala accepted Islam before Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala he, he proposed to her and she replied I have embraced Islam if you accept Islam I will marry you. So he embraced Islam, and that was the dowry agreed upon between them. This is an authentic hadith. So this also shows us that the something as simple as the acceptance, uh, which is simple, but is avim, it's, it's great and magnificent, if one embraces Islam, and that being the mahar of the woman. Uh, a point I want to mention with regards to this, because we also have a problem with often women that in uh, uh, the uh, many of the societies that are mixed societies, the women, uh, Muslim women, they work alongside uh, non-Muslim men. And so many of the women consider themselves tabliking or making dawah to these non-Muslim uh, men, which is good in the sense that if they're already in that environment, if they're sharing the knowledge of Islam, and ha trying to practice as much Islamic mannerisms as possible, then if they share the message of Islam, this is the best of speech that they could be engaging in if they are forced to uh, engage in speech. But however, what we also find is some of the women going out and, uh, you know, maybe unfortunately, Akramakum Allah having boyfriends and things like this, and then they want to marry the man, so he takes the shahada. This is not what the maqsood here was or what the intention here was. But here was a situation in which uh, this illustrates that it is permissible for the uh, woman or uh, to accept as a mahar or a dowry that the man accepts Islam if he is not a Muslim and he uh, wants to marry her. Uh, another important uh, aspect regarding the dowry and this is what we'll cover in the first hadith and this relates to that uh, the manumission of a slave woman uh, can be uh, her dowry meaning that if a man wishes to marry a slave woman or a slave girl and it can be among her condition that she be freed uh, and this can be sufficient as her mahar as the Prophet والسلام, did with uh, Safiya and we will cover this in the uh, in the first hadith moving on to the first hadith narrated in Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu the Prophet والسلام, said uh, the Prophet وسلم, set Safiya free عنها, and made her freedom her dowry. Uh, In this hadith, this illustrates the, as we mentioned, is one of the conditions with regards to the mahar or one of the permissible types of mahars or sadaq is to uh, free the slave girl. So this was the first chapter that Imam uh, Ibn Hajr al-Askalani rahimahullah ta'ala rahmatullah that he began uh, this chapter with. Some of the important uh, benefits of this hadith is firstly this hadith shows us the hikmah or the wisdom of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And this was through his choosing Safiya uh, uh, to be his wife and to free her. 
and to be from the mother of the believers. So this shows this is a great, uh, a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be chosen. Can you imagine being chosen by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for anything which is good? And Safiya radiallahu anha was chosen to be freed after having been a slave girl. Which of course in the status of all societies, slaves are considered, they are the lowest uh, of the social rung, uh, the social ladder. They are owned. They are human beings who are owned. So to be chosen by the greatest of humanity, to be freed, and then to marry Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam radiallahu ta'ala anha shows that this was uh, a, a, a great boosting of her status and a great ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and shows the wisdom of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam because he sallallahu alayhi wasallam could have had the most as far as uh, from tribe or as far as from uh, any of the characteristics that human beings see as desirable or see as a type of status on the social scale, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have had that. He could have had the daughters of the, of the, the, of the uh, heads of the tribe of Quraysh or whatever he had liked for his choosing. But he chose Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha and gave her that esteemed status of being the wife of the one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu and one of the mother of the believers and to be freed from bondage radiallahu ta'ala anha. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us is uh, that it is important to consider the hearts of people. Islam encourages us to be observant of people's uh, condition and how people are feeling, people around you. So from the wisdom of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and from his love for his Ummah and love for mankind in that he was a mercy for mankind that he looked to the heart uh, looked to the status of Sophia that she wasn't I don't think most people are uh, emboldened and feel happy and proud about being a slave and so with her having lost her freedom to then becoming a slave this was something that affected not only her status, but affected her as a person. It affected her heart. And the Prophet wasallam, by freeing her and treating her with kindness, marrying her, taking her from bondage, was being observant of not only her status, but of her heart and taking care of her heart and encouraging her to be one of the best of humanity, and that was being one of the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, being the mother of the believers. Radiallahu ta'ala anhunna. So this, uh, what we learn from this point in the hadith is that we should be vigilant and observant of people's status and how, and how people are feeling that are around us. And we should do things in order to strengthen and encourage them and, and comfort their hearts and not belittle and destroy them. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that the permissibility of freeing a slave girl and making uh, her freedom her dowry. So this shows us that this is permissible because this was the action of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Another benefit of this hadith 
is this hadith also shows us that it is that um, Islam and the marital contract does not require that you say a specific uh, statement necessarily uh, with regards to uh, the the marital bond, accepting a proposal or something to this effect, but rather this hadith shows us that it's permissible anything which is evidence which shows that the uh, that one is accepting the proposal or that uh, that they want to uh, that they want to submit the marital contract so that it is not required a specific uh, a specific statement but anything that illustrates that that is evidence for that regardless of the language is sufficient as long as it is known from the custom that this means that yes she is accepting the proposal or he is proposing and they both accept this uh, this uh, uh, marital contract and that uh, you know that he is going to pay the mahar or he has offered the mahar or what have you another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the fadila or the greatness of Safiya that she radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, was is one of the ummahat al mu'minin that she's one of the mother of the believers and that is that should suffice us there uh, another great benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal in that the one who was forced meaning Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, that she was released from that from being in bondage to being raised to the highest status and again going back to the benefit we already mentioned her heart was broken to be once a, a, a walking freed person to then becoming a slave no matter what culture or what have you that slaves are unanimously humiliated they're in a hum humiliated sta status a humiliated st uh, status and uh, this for one who is not born into slavery but one who is actually taken from freedom into slavery then this is even uh, probably a greater hardship for them to to have known freedom and then to have it taken away from them to adjust to this new status so this is something that affects the heart and hurts the heart and harms the heart and by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granting her freedom through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was a strengthening of her heart and it shows the mercy of your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next hadith, narrated Abu Salama ibn Abdurrahman radiallahu ta'ala an. I asked Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an, عنها, how much had Allah's Messenger وسلم, given his dowry? She replied, his dowry to his wives was 12 uqiyya and a nashish. She asked, do you know what a nashish is? I replied, no. She said, it is half an uqiyya, hence the total was 500 dirhams. And that was Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's dowry to his wives reported by Muslim. <clears throat> In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Alaihi Wasallam, there are immense benefits that we need to uh, observe. One of the first benefits that we find in this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us the benefit or the greatness of the Salaf, the Salaf al salih the, uh, the importance of the first, the pious predecessors, meaning the first three generations in Islam, and their hars al ilm that they also were vigilant and seeking knowledge. 
and the pious predecessors, this refers to meaning the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala majma'in, the Tabi'een, rahimahumullah jami'in, wutba'a Tabi'een, rahimahumullah jami'in. So that means the first three generations of Muslims. And the first three generations referring to the best of the Ummah. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خير الناس قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the best people is my generation then those who follow them then those who follow them so that is the first three generations of Muslims those people who were the most adherent to following the kitab Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and their understanding makes up the understanding that we try to traverse. So in this hadith, <clears throat> it shows us the hurs or the vigilance of the Salaf in seeking knowledge. In that, uh, Abi Salama <clears throat> uh, ibn Abdurrahman, uh, that he asked uh, Aisha about this very important issue regarding the uh, dowry of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what the extent of the dowry uh, was for his wives and this is uh, we find this in the statement he said I asked Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an, ta how much had Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam given as a dowry so here this shows that the Salaf that they were concerned about knowledge they were concerned about knowledge, not just for the sake of just gaining knowledge, but for the sake of practice and understanding and using the, uh, the knowledge that they gain in order to make proper understanding and use of the text or use of what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. So they, they sought knowledge in order to come closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to better practice their deen, to better understand their deen and to make use of the evidences of the core text of their deen. So they were making proper istidlal and istanbat because they were trying to follow with vigilance the son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this hadith illustrates their vigilance and their love for ilm. And as a statement, one of the Salaf used to say, Talab uh, al-ilm, Talab al-jannah that seeking knowledge is seeking paradise. So that the one who strives to attain knowledge, that they should have a correct intention. They should have a correct intention that they are seeking this knowledge in order to come closer to Allah to strengthen their ties with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to worship Him better on basira and ilm and fiqh. And if it is to give da'wah and convey that message, then it is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this shows that it is very important to have a sahih or sound qast, a sound intention when seeking knowledge even, when doing all of these great acts of ibadah, and the salaf were first and foremost in that. The second benefit uh, of this hadith is this hadith shows us that it is lawful for a man to speak to a woman who is not uh, rel uh, related to him or as long as there's maslaha, as long as there is uh, some sort of benefit for that. Meaning not to speak, this isn't evidence for speaking about just anything, uh, to speak about foul things, to seek to... Uh, to get acquainted and so forth, but rather if there is a true maslaha shari. And in this case, uh, Abi Salama was asking uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in order to get a sharia ruling, in order to gain Islamic knowledge. So he was asking her something that there was immense maslaha because there's maslaha of learning about one's religion.
another benefit of this hadith, which is also something that we we have to uh, take heed of and learn and understand, is this hadith also is evidence that the sound of a woman is not her aura. That the sound of a woman is not her aura, meaning her her sacred. Uh, sacredness that should be covered, meaning that it's permissible, again, if there's maslaha, to, for the men and women to speak to one another. So in case of asking for a fatwa, asking for someone of knowledge, for a fatwa or, or for some Islamic benefit. So this is very important for us to understand that because many of the people, they take the woman's sound as an aura, and then it ends up being that they prohibit something and cut off the ties of something, which may be necessity or there may be good in that. That does not mean women should be out there, uh, you know, in the marketplaces yelling and fight, arguing and, and, and having ill behavior. But it shows us that the woman's, uh, this hadith is evidence that the woman's uh, su uh, sound, her voice, is not aura. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that it is necessary for a mufti, you know, someone who's going to give an Islamic ruling or judgment or fatwa, that if they detect that the person asking for a judgment is ignorant about something or ignorant in understanding, uh, does not comprehend what they are articulating, that they should ask the person to make sure that they're clear. So this hadith also is evidence uh, for that. Likewise, in this hadith, is this hadith also shows us that the main way of seeking knowledge or learning is through asking. That people, by asking about those things which you have difficulty in comprehending, that this will uh, help you to get clarified those things which you don't understand. And so this should be a common principle, but we deduce this also from this hadith, and this hadith shows us in that, uh, uh, in the hadith, there was the uh, Abi, uh, Abi Salama, radiallahu ta'ala, when he asked Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala, <clears throat> about the dowry of the uh, Ummahatul uh, Mu'mineen, she replied, the dowry to his wives was 12 ruqya. Then she asked, uh, 12 ruqya and a nashish. So the, maybe the term nashish may not have been uh, easily understood by Abi Salama. Or he may not have known. Or it could have been from a dialect which was not common from his tribe or whatever the case may be. So what did Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha do? She then asked him to, for clarification. She said, do you know what a nashis is? And then he replied, no. So this shows us that this was something that he had ashka, that he had some problem comprehending. And she asked him a question in order to clarify, to make sure that he was clear about what she was uh, imparting upon him from knowledge. So very uh, important that. And that it comes from the fiqh and the understanding of the uh, the the person being asked questions, the scholar, the alim, the mufti, what have you. Those are some of the main uh, benefits of this hadith. In the next hadith, the 883rd hadith, according to my text, narrated. Ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu radiyallahu ta'ala anhumah 
when Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu married Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, give her something as a dowry. He replied, I have nothing. He said, where is your Hotaniya coat of mail, meaning his armor, reported by Abu Dawood and the Nisa'i, Al-Hakam graded it as Sahih or authentic. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu tal'an, radiallahu tal'anhumah, some of the benefits of this hadith is that in this hadith we see this hadith is as evidence showing the fadl of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'anhu in that he married the daughter of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Fatima radiallahu ta'anhu so this shows the fadl of Ali ibn Abi Talib, this is a great status for someone to be married to the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This shows the immense fadl and that he was beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and had a high status aside from the uh, familia relations that they had as well. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows that also uh, that it is uh, an obligation to have a mahar as we mentioned in the uh, prior to this that the mahar is an essential part of the uh, fulfilling the marital contract and so uh, and, and this is due, we learn this from the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Atiha Shayin. He said, give her something. And so here, I mean giving her something, meaning give her something for her mahar, for her dowry. You know, this will be better for her heart. This is the, uh, of course, the, the custom of Islam. And this will, and you know, even if it's something small. And he, he replied, that, you know, I don't have anything. I, I don't have anything. So the Prophet ﷺ then said, where is your, your, your armor, your, your Hatamiya armor? You know, where is your chain mail? And this is not that she necessarily, she was going to benefit from this chain mail, but it was the fact of giving her something for her, ma for her mahar, even though she didn't request anything and didn't have any specific thing. But because his means were restricted at this time, that he, he mentioned, I don't have anything. So the Prophet ﷺ asked about his chain, his, his armor, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, showing us the necessity of the mahar, even for someone who is poor and impoverished, that they should try to offer something. And that way it fulfills this important sunnah uh, of the marital contract, this important uh, part of the uh, the marital con contract, and when sunnah, I mean, I don't mean sunnah that it's it's uh, mustahab that it's recommended, but I mean that this is an obligatory uh, part of the marital uh, contract is fulfilling giving the mahar. Another benefit of this hadith. Uh, or a side uh, benefit is that regarding that the scholars differ with regards to, uh, for example, if a man himself says that he stipulates, for example, he wants to marry a woman and she wants to marry him or whatever the case may be. Maybe she wants to marry him. She offers herself to him, whatever the case may be. And then the man makes it a stipulation, you know, maybe he doesn't have money, he says, my stipulation is that there is no maha. He makes that a condition. As we mentioned, uh, shurut fi nikah wa shurut 
Shurot Nikah, the conditions for marriage and the conditions within the marriage contract. So in this case, this would be a Shurot Finika. This would be a Shurot, a condition, a shart, a condition in the marriage. Okay, this would, this, and as we mentioned, the Prophet Sallallahu said that any condition which is not in the book of the law, then it is batal, meaning anything that contradicts the, the, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu then it is false. So in this case, a man making it a stipulation, something which is a well-known stipulation of the marital contract or a part of the marital contract, stipulating that he is to be, uh, to be, you know, not uh, making it not an obligation for him to have to fulfill that, then this would actually be false. So the scholars differ, the mes'ala then becomes, the scholars diff differ over the soundness of this marriage, meaning if he stipulated this and she agreed to this, or whatever the case may be, is the marriage then sound or not? So the scholars differ. Some of them, they say, no, that this is, uh, they, they, the scholars, they agree over that this, uh, this condition is false, that this is a false condition. They agree that making, that a man making this condition, this stipulation that he does not have to pay a mahar, that that is a false condition because he made this, which is her right. It has to do with her haq. And so he is now stipulating that he does not have to fulfill her right. And that is not his right to stipulate that. So the scholars agree that that is a false stipulation. Where they disagree is whether the marriage that took place with this false stipulation is still sound or not. Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah mentions as a, uh, in what he felt was the most sound view, he said that this nikah, this marriage is not sound. That it is not sound because he is negating something which is a necessity of the, uh, the marital contract. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us a very important principle أن الخبر مبني على ظن لا يعاد كذبا كذبا which means that ولو خالف الواقع meaning that if someone says something to the best of their ability what they thought was the most correct they thought it was the most correct view or they thought or it was uh, they thought that this was uh, true about themselves or whatever the case may be. They, they were almost certain that it was true. That even if that goes against the truth, that is not considered lying. How do we know and understand this from this hadith? Because in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ uh, asked Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an, you know, to give something for the mahar. And he replied, he said, Ma'indi shay'un. He said, Ma'indi shay'un. He said, I, I don't have anything. So he replied to the best of his ability, he didn't have anything that he thought would be worthwhile to give as a mahar. That was in accordance with the best of his ability. Then the Prophet ﷺ asked about his armor, because he didn't even consider giving his armor. And... He, uh, he asked about his armor, and that was uh, the case that the armor was to be made as a mahar. So what we learn from this hadith is affirms for us this important principle that if someone says something to the best of their ability, that they thought what they were saying was true, that that does not consider that is not considered lying, even even though they were mistaken from the truth and what they said was uh, uh, indifference to the truth. Another uh, benefit from this hadith is that this hadith shows that it is uh, 
that it is also permissible to give something as a mahar, something which does not necessarily have any direct benefit for the woman. However, in most cases, in most scenarios and situations, women, uh, and especially in most traditional societies that are Muslim, they, the women already have an idea of what they want for a mahar. So then this is not even, it doesn't even become an issue. But in an issue where the man is, doesn't have the means and the woman agrees to his proposal and he doesn't have anything really to give her except something very simple which she may not even benefit from. So it shows that it's, it's permissible in this case uh, that it, it is permissible to give the woman something which she doesn't even have gained benefit from. In the case of Ali ibn Abi Talib, it was uh, then permissible. One thing uh, Fatima uh, could have done was to sell his armor. His armor had worth and value, so she could have pawned it or sold it and gained benefit from that. However, from this hadith, the fuqaha, some of them, they deduce that it is permissible to give a woman a mahar in which, meaning that she hasn't, she probably, if she says anything, anything that you can, and he doesn't have anything. And he says, all I have is this pen that I, I really like this pen, and I'm giving you, you this as your mahar, because I don't have anything. And she accepts that, then that's permissible, even if she cannot benefit from the pen. Perhaps she can't write. Perhaps, uh, you know, the pen has very little value to her, but, it still fulfills the condition of a maha. Those are the main benefits uh, of this hadith. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil.